you know, it's, it's, we've got a God that cannot lie, as Tom was saying, that never does this and doesn't do that and can't change. And we've got this God that, that is so amazing, and yet we see so much trouble in the world. And if we really have a good look, this, whole, this, this world is his idea. <laughs> it's not man's idea. This is God's idea. But somehow or other, something crept in that stopped the plan of God. Something crept in that, that started a mess with what God wanted to do. And, and man, because he's got a will and he's got his own desires, can be led astray, can go after things that we want in the flesh. So I, this, just the, this morning I was writing down and I wanted to ask myself this question. Does the Christian really want God to be God? And, you know, I, I've never really asked myself this question before like that. But do I really want God to be God? Or do I just want Him to be my buddy? Do I just want Him to be my go-for? Do I just want Him to be my provider? Do I just want Him to be my healer? Then I thought, does the church really want God to rule and reign over us? You see... God is a king. He is, our, he is the one that wants to rule and reign. Not because, not because he's got a problem. Not because he's got this power kick. But because he knows that if we allow God to have full access into our life, if we have our ears and our hearts and our eyes and every part of us open to what God wants, that only good will come around our life. But when we are drawn away from God, when we're drawn aside, when, when things get around us, God wants to rule and reign over us because he knows what's best for us. Do you believe that today? Jesus, who is our example, was going to go through a circumstance and a situation in his life where he knew that the people that he loved so much the people that he came to die for were going to mock him. We're going to despise him. We're going to spit on him. We're going to crucify him. And I would imagine that when we're thinking something like that, a lot of things go through your mind. Jesus was a man. He was God, yes, but he came as a man. He emptied himself and he lived on this planet as a man. And he thought, Hey, if, if you can take this cup from me, or if you can take this cross from me, please take it. That's not a bad idea. That would be nice. But then he said this, But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You know, I find this, a lot of times when life comes, and I suppose today there's elections and there's people there that, uh, don't like Trump and there's people there that don't like Biden and there's obviously a lot of confusion going on over in America at the moment and there's a lot of things that are still going to happen, I would imagine. But you see, if I'm praying a particular way, say if I'm praying, oh God, I want Trump to be president, I want Trump to be president, and it doesn't happen the way that I want it to happen, then confusion reigns, then I sort of get negative, think God doesn't answer my prayer. You see, God might never ever have wanted to answer that prayer. All I know is this, I've never, I haven't prayed for Donald Trump to win, I haven't prayed for Biden to win, I've only prayed God have your way. Because you see, God knows what is best for the nations of the world. He knows what's going to bring about revival, He knows what's going to bring about the presence of God. He knows, He knows, He knows, He knows everything. But do we really want God to rule and reign over us? Do we really want Him to be our God? Do we really want Him to be, or do we just want Him to be our, our, our guy that does everything for us whenever we ask Him to do it? All I know is this, is that God says that my ways are not your ways. My ways are higher than your ways. And I don't know about you, but I can trust God in whatever is going on, on this, in this planet. Sure, the enemy's made a mess. Sure, the enemy's come in like a flood. Sure, the enemy has raised up a, a rebellion and goodness knows what else. 
But somewhere along the line, we've got to understand that God is God. And he wants to be God. And he's going to be God, whether you like it or not, or whether I like it or not. Hmm. Not my will, but thine be done. You see, independence or my way is the new word for rebellion. We find out in the scriptures, right throughout the scriptures, what I love about this book, it just, it's not just a book of great success where the church is painted in a picture of flourishing goodness and always doing what God wants it to do and always on top and always victorious. I find it's a book that talks the truth. And it does say this, it says, There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. You can do it your way or you can do it my way. See, there's a guy there that, that uh, wrote, sang a song, and the song is, uh, I'll do it my way. Frank Sinatra wrote that song. I think we should have it as one of our choruses in the church. Because, you see, because we're human, we all want to do it our way. I, I, want, I want things to, to be done the way I want it to be done. I like it my way, amen? But sometimes it's not always my way. And the Word of God doesn't just paint a glossy picture of a, of a bunch of people that are all doing the right thing. No, there's a bunch of people there that did the wrong thing and God talks about the consequences. God knows the best thing. I, I don't want to speak rebellion, but there's a way that it says in Proverbs 14, 12, uh, it says, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. 1 Samuel, I'm going to speak a little bit about Sam in Samuel in a few moments, speaks about a nation that wanted to do it their way. They just wanted to do it their way. But if we can understand that God's way is the best way, you believe that today? The children of God wanted to do it their way, which was the way of immorality, the way of orgies, and they wanted to serve gods that suited their desires. See, there's a lot of things in the Scriptures here. You see, if we really got down to it, and we really got into doctrine and philosophies and traditions of man, there are so many different doctrines and traditions and things like that that take man away from the purpose of God. And I want to tell you, if you really want to get into a real, real argument, start talking about tithing. Because you see, there's people that, that have in their thinking and so forth, they're just so convinced that you don't have to tithe, and there's other people that are totally convinced that you need to tithe, and all I know is what the Bible says. And there's a lot of things there that the church today is living in that's so contrary to what the Word of God says. Would that be true? And, and But somewhere or other, if we can... Humble ourselves and say, Lord, not my way, but thine be done. Satan is the master of disguise. People are led away by Satan's cunning ways. We might look at each other and start to see things. And, you know, I'm, I'm moved when I, when I see hurting people. I see babies that are all messed up. Cancer in children's wards. There's something that begins to rise up in me that I, I just hate that so much. And then you, somebody comes along and says, you know, you might be there and you say you're a Christian and they say, well, if you believe in that God and he allows this. And, and I can understand people how they think like that, but if you see... Satan has sown a seed of a lie. It's never, ever been God's intention to bring sickness and diseases and things like that upon the earth. But when man walks away from God, or when mankind gets out from underneath the spout where the glory comes out, we move away from God, all trouble and all things come in. Satan is the master of the skies, and he will con you 
He will trick you. He will do whatever he can to get you away from truth. He tells it. He can have his way in your life. You see, to serve God, I believe, is a God of is, is victory. And I want to just share some things today. I just want to ask you this before I, before I go there. I spoke this the other week, and, and I, I keep, I keep coming back to this. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked man rules, the people groan. And I just wrote this this morning. When the Lord rules and reigns in your life, you will rejoice. But when the wicked or the flesh man rules, you will groan. And see, this is what the enemy wants to do. He wants to get you out from underneath God's way and he takes you over here into another way and that way seems right unto a man but it takes you away from and it takes you out of and it brings you into a place where you are open and the enemy can come in and just sow whatever he wants to sow into your life. Our hope is in him. Jesus is our hope. He's our refuge. He's our God. And if you'd like to open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 7. See, Satan is a master of disguise and he has deceived so many people. And we know that the children of Israel, they were, he, he brought them out of, the, out of the bondage. He took them through and he helped them. He, he protected them. He fed them and everything like that. But they soon forgot how good God was. And it wasn't very long even after they came out of bondage that, that when Moses was up there seeking God, seeking direction for the people, been up there 40 days and, and, and the people said, they got around and, and they started to murmur. You know one of the greatest dangers in a church is murmuring? You know your opinion really doesn't really matter. How you think it should happen, how you think this church should run, how it really doesn't matter. What really matters is what God thinks. I had a, I can remember once at a conference, and there was a, uh, a group of people that, uh, that brought their band out to, to, to sing and play. And uh, it was rock and roll. Man, she was rock and roll. I've never seen anything like it. Bill Haley would have had a field day there. And it was loud and it was, and it was rock and roll. Glory to God. And, and Kevin Dales, who was here just the other week, he rang me up after conference and he said, Neil, what, do you, what did you think about that band? And almost out of my mouth came my opinion which if, if I would have allowed my opinion to come out, I would have totally agreed with what he was thinking. And we would have had a real good session. But as I opened my mouth, and as I began to speak, I said, really, Kev, it doesn't matter what I thought or what you thought. What you have to ask is, what did God think? And I said, really, we went into some amazing worship. <laughs> we had an, the presence of God came in. And from that moment on, my opinion, I realized, does not really matter. We've got opinions, and many of them, just like we all have armpits, and so them smell. <laughs> We've got to be careful what, how we speak and how, how we... And these children of God, they, they all had their opinions. And, and as I was talking about Moses, and, and, and you know, they, they, they made a molten calf and they began to worship it because they, they wanted to worship something. They forgot about God. Let's just worship something else. Let's just do it our way. Let's do our thing, something that satisfies us. And, of course, when Moses came down, there was a great orgy going on. 
immorality just poured into that thing. Children of Israel forgot, but I can't understand God's mercy and God's grace. Can you? Can you really understand God's mercy and God's grace? And, you know, when I've done wrong and things like that and I don't deserve anything, I've just got to realize that God loves me so much anyhow that if, I'm, if I just come before him and say, God, you know my heart, I'm sorry, that he is faithful to forgive me. If I've got a wrong attitude, if I've done something wrong, and you know I've, I'm very transparent in this church and I've told you some naughty things that I've done that I'm not proud of even though I smile. That God loved them so much, even though they'd done wrong, and He was there for them. God is fighting for us. God is there for us. You, you know, right now, God is hovering over the, the nations of the world. There, there's, we, we have got no idea what is going on in America right now. There's a lot of different opinions, and there's a lot of thoughts and things like that. But I want to tell you, I always reckon if there's a lot of horsemen you around, there's got to be a horse somewhere. There's some skullduggery going on there somewhere, amen? And though I don't understand it, I don't know, and I don't really, it's got nothing to do with me. But there's a, it's not what we're seeing in the natural. It's got very, very, can I say this? It's got very, very little to do with Trump and Biden. But it's got everything to do with the Lord and, and, and Satan. And once we can turn our attention like that, well, we know that God's in authority. God is fighting for us. God is, uh, will overtake. God will do it for us. And, and all the children of Israel, they've done so much and they've done it their own way. And, and in verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 3, Then Samuel spoke to the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtarans from among you, and prepare your heart for the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. And I believe that these words are still ringing true today like never before. If you return to the Lord with all your heart and put away all the foreign gods or the foreign things and the things that take our attention, the things that, that we worship, I was going to say I've got a granddaughter that worships a dog. That dog is treated better than a lot of people I know. And so they did it. They did what God had spoken. If you've got a need to hear what God's saying, and we do what God tells us to do, I want to tell you success must come your way, whatever way it comes. So when the... When the, the children of God did what was, what was supposed to happen and they, they put away their gods and they started to serve the Lord. And it says here in uh, 1 Samuel uh, 7, uh, verse 7, Now when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together as if that, the Lord of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. So the children of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us. That he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. First of all, they feared, so they started to cry, Don't, don't you know, keep lifting this up. So Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Because this is speaking, and this is a typology of Jesus Christ who was going to come in the flesh. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now, as Samuel was offering the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. 
that the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day. They were so confused that they were overcome before Israel. And of course then the children of Israel, they ran after them, they pursued them, and they destroyed them. You see, so it goes on in, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in uh, Samuel 8, 1 to 7. It speaks about, you know, they had a good time, and, but now Samuel gets old and he puts his sons in, in charge, but his sons don't do the right thing. So they, the, the elders of the church, not, not just anybody, but the elders, the leaders came and said, hey, he said, you're getting old, your sons aren't serving God. Why don't you, why don't you just uh, make us a king? so we can be like every other nation. The trouble is with the church, that cry that came that day has been a curse upon the church right till now. Because somehow or other the church wants to become more like the world, and when we, the more we become like the world, the less power we have. And so, of course, we know that, that uh, they raise up Saul. Saul is anointed king. And Saul starts to do his thing. Saul had no respect and no honor for authority. He couldn't care less about anybody else. He just wanted to do what he wanted to do. And of course, we know there that, that this caused a lot of problems in the land. So then we find in, in Samuel uh, 16, and the Lord said to Samuel, because you see, God had to move away from, the, from, Sam, from Saul. One of the things that, that I want to say, if we can sort of catch what I'm saying here, friend, you can be in a church, we can be playing church, but God's not with us. Or oh, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there. Yeah, okay. You can, you can say those sort of things, and God will be there, but He's looking for something. And the children of Israel, they, they were there, but but there was Saul's reign was, was being taken away. And, and so in 1 Samuel 16 verse 1, And the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Whatever has been built by man's hand, God cannot bless. Lest the Lord build the house, they that build it labor in vain. Do you believe that today? We've got to somehow or other come back. And it, and it says, fill your horn with oil and go. I have provided myself a king. Mourning usually speaks about death. But this man wasn't dead. God had taken the mantle off him. The anointing left Saul. Not because God wanted to do something new or something else. No, he left Saul because Saul left him. And we, the church, can walk away from what God wants to do in our lives. We can say, well, we, we, we want to do it this way. We want to do that. We want... No, friend, we've got to do it God's way. Seek the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in every way acknowledge Him. You see, you are a vessel. A horn is a vessel. It is a container. He said, fill that horn, fill that vessel, fill that container with oil. Oil speaks about the anointing. It speaks about the anointing. You are a vessel. You need to be filled. I need to be filled. Tickling your ears will not fill you. It might, it might satisfy some people's thinking, but friend, unless we somehow or other break out of the natural into the realm of the spirit, Nothing around our lives will change. Nothing around our city will change. Our city needs the anointing. Our city needs a move of God. Our city needs a move of the Spirit. You see, the anointing left Saul. And Samuel, he took that in 16 verse 13. It says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him from that day. Verse 14, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. It's all right to have some fears. 
My greatest fear is that the Spirit of the Lord would depart from us. David's greatest fear when he, when he got into some trouble and did some stupid things, he started to cry out to God. He said, God, God, but take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Take not your anointing from my life. Lord, anoint us with fresh oil today. Fill us. It's not God's will, but the Spirit of God can depart from a church, from a person's life. Isaiah 61 verse 1, he declared, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because God has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Jesus declared it in Luke 4, 17, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because God has anointed me. Who will declare it to this generation? You see, what Jesus was doing, he, he picked up the book and, and he began to read from the prophet Isaiah. And he started to speak the will of God. There are types and shadows and prophetic words and goodness knows what. But you see, it just didn't stop there. Like in Isaiah, when Isaiah said those words, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me. Then Jesus comes on the scene and he opens up the book and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to bring great tidings to the, to the poor and everything like that. And then somehow or other we just think, well, that was great, that was Jesus, and that's done. No, I want to tell you, that is a continuation. Every one of us today can stand in a, in a place and start to cry out, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me. We're, we're not just here get, to get by. God wants that same anointing that was on Jesus. Jesus even made statements that blow your mind. These things that I do, you can do also. And even greater things than this shall you do. God doesn't want us just to be a bunch of people sitting in a pew, singing a few songs and, and playing church. He wants us to be the church. He wants us to be powerful. He wants to anoint us. He wants to, this is what he said, these signs will follow them that believe. In my name, they will Speak in other tongues. In my name, they will cast out demons. In my name, they will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Hallelujah. That's the purpose of the church. But we're sitting around playing church. We've got to understand that, you know, the Spirit of God can depart, can lift. But I want to tell you, I believe that He wants to come back. If my people will humble themselves and pray. John the Baptist said in Matthew 3, 11, he said, I baptize you with water unto repentance, that he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. This Holy Spirit, this mighty Holy Spirit, that John is talking about is the same spirit that came upon David, the same spirit that came upon Isaiah, the same spirit that came upon Jesus, the same spirit, declare it, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Am I a candidate? Can, can, can God do that for me? Uh, uh, or, or see, in your mind, what's the enemy put in your mind? We've got to have a mind surge clearing. So somehow or other we can start to think like God thinks about us. The same spirit that Isaiah spoke about, the same spirit that Jesus declared, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. I am a candidate for that same anointing. So are you. Romans 8.11 says this, but if the same spirit of him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal, mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. I want to tell you, I believe that the church needs the Spirit of God to come again to raise us from wrong thinking, from deadness. Church has gone to sleep. Reinhard Bonnke said, it, said in Matthew 3.11 this way, 
I baptize you in water for the remission of sins, that he, Jesus, will immerse you in liquid fire. I like that, amen? Jesus truly is the baptizer in the mighty life-transforming power of God himself. Jesus is the baptizer. Sin, sickness, death are under his feet. Do you believe that today? Hell itself, hell itself has been taken captive. Jesus wears the victor's crown. When we're baptized in the mighty person of the Holy Spirit, we see, we, we, we receive the spirit of victory. You believe that today? Power, love, and dominion. But remember last week I spoke about the egg. The egg was never meant to be scrambled. It was meant to be a chicken. But if you take the egg out of its environment, take, bring it around negativity, failure and defeat, Take the Christian out of the environment of the Holy Spirit. Negativity. Different things get around our lives. We've got to somehow or other believe God. There's people that say, and Clark used to say it a lot to us, you'll never have in the natural what you can't see in the Spirit. And if we realize we'll, we see so much in the natural, that's why very rarely do we see it in the Spirit. Yet it's the opposite. You'll never see in the natural what you can't see in the Spirit. And there's things there that will spark you. And my dad, who didn't want to serve God, he didn't want anything to do with God. He told me when I got born again, he said, Neil, that's a crutch. It's a crutch for weak people. Weak people need a crutch. And these things, these words affect you because he's your dad. And every, every, it come along to our conferences because we put on a prawn salad thing that he wanted, the prawn, so he'd come along and he'd endure the meeting. But you see, there was a man when we came to the Sunshine Coast. He looked very, very much like my dad. Very, very much like my dad. And I'd be there leading the worship or whatever I was doing, and, and I'd see this man in the church with his hands raised. And I would look at that man, and I'd start to glean from that. And I'd, all of a sudden that man changed, and he became my dad. And I started to see my dad in church with his hands raised. Started to see in the spirit, and then... Unbeknownst to us all, because Jody used to ask him every conference, do you want to give your life to, uh, to Jesus, Granddad? And he would swear at her. Not only did Jody hear it, but everybody around heard it. He was as tough as custard, my dad. It was a big show. And one night at a conference, and Jody, I think, had sort of given up on him. I don't blame her. I had too. And there was a, a man by the name of Ruckus McKinley was doing some dancing and stuff like that and, and he made an altar call for people who wanted to get born again, give their lives to Christ. And at 86, my dad, or eight, I think he was about 82 at the time, my dad looked at me right up the other end. He said, are you going out? I said, yeah, I must. <laughs> yeah, I'll go out. And my dad walked out the front and gave his life to Jesus. And then Ruckens said these words, and I thought, you've lost my dad because I knew, you see, but I'm thinking in the natural. He said, everybody in the front, and there was, could have been 100 people or more, he said, lift your hands. And I thought, oh, this will never happen. Dad, this little dad will walk off the platform now. But I watched my dad lift his two hands. And what I saw in the natural, what I saw in the spirit, as I looked at that, came real in the natural. See, it's very, very real. But somehow or other, our minds and our emotions and our lives get messed up with disappointments. Have you ever been disappointed? 
You think you're the only person in the world when it's happening to you. No, it's, 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 it's very, very real. But I want you to know this. You are the temple. You are the horn. You are the container. You're the vessel that needs to be filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit. That's why I was so thrilled on Tuesday night to see 26 people come to the prayer meeting. I'm still believing for 50. I'm still believing for 100. I'm still believing that that will be the, that is the strength, that is, that is the powerhouse of this church. I want to encourage you to come. What Tom was explaining there about the presence of God and goodness knows what, how he was explaining it there. A lot of people sit and look at Tom when he's talking like that, look, like you're looking at a cow, like a cow looks at a new gate. One man sees a shaft of light come down. Oh, wow, well, 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 never seen that. Somebody saw an angel. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not dependent upon those things. But what I am very dependent upon is that when I go to that meeting, when I go there and for an hour when we pray in the Spirit and, and believe God, that things start happening and the horn, the vessel is being filled. And what Tom was really saying, that he goes home filled. He goes home that, that this vessel, this, this, this container, whatever it might be, gets filled. And you go home and you, you run on that oil, amen. If you don't fill your car up with petrol, it doesn't take long to run out, amen. We've got to, we're, we're people of God that need to be filled afresh again and again and again. But you are the temple, you are the horn, you are the container, the vessel that is being filled with the oil or filled with the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 2, 9 says this, that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. That's who you are. He called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I just want to say, guys and girls, rise up, you people of power. Rise up. Be filled. Open your vessels. There's so many things in the natural that... that Take us away. But let the Spirit of God come upon us again. Amen. As we worship, watching a young lady up here, watching her pouring her heart out, watching her giving of herself and, and, and just warning. Because you see, what you see on the platform is not necessarily what you think you see. It's her lifestyle. That's how she lives. She does that in, the, in her own bedroom. She does that in, a, in, in wherever she is. That's what she does. She is a worshiper. She wants to worship in spirit and truth. I watch Jody up here. I watch her as she starts to sing and the presence of God comes in over her life. Because you see, it's not just what they do on Sunday morning. But unfortunately for many of the church members, when we come of a Sunday morning, this is the only time we've even spoken or even thought about God. with me? We need to change. We need to worship. We need to fill our horns with oil. And let, let the Spirit of God come upon us. I want to challenge you. Come along to the prayer meeting. I know you've got ten excuses that just ran into your head straight away. <laughs> At least ten. All got... <laughs> you know why? Because the enemy's got your program. Nancy asked me to do something. <laughs> Come on. Most of us are like the rest of us. And you don't even have to think anymore because of your... Pro <laughs> Amen. Oh, Father. Come on, let's stand to our feet. People carry something. We are carriers. We're carriers of a mantle. We're carriers of, of the presence of God. We're 
if we're filled, it will touch people. I just want to encourage you to fill your horn with oil. Fill your vessel with oil. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit of God get around us. Now, He knows your name. He knows your name. He knows your name. How many people are glad about that? Give me a wave if you're happy about that. He knows my name. He knows your name. But you know what else he knows? Every one of your thoughts. He knows everything about you. He knows what's stopping you. He knows what's what the enemy's planted in you that's caused resistance. He knows, he knows, he knows. I believe he's calling people today to make a fresh stand. A fresh stand. A fresh stand. I'll let the Spirit of God explain that to you. Do you know if something's going on in, around you today, you say, I want to make that fresh stand today. I want to break out of the grip of the enemy, all the lies and all the deceit, all the junk that he's put into my thinking all the wrong stuff that spewed out of my mouth, all the whatever it might be. And I want to make a fresh stand today. I, I want to come out of bondage. I, I want to be free. I want, to be, I want my vessel to be filled again. I want this horn to be filled again. This is the Spirit of God is. While we're singing this song, you feel to come and make a stand. Make a stand against unrighteousness and stuff that gets around us. Okay. You know my name. 